I am an honest guy who made an honest mistake. I was there. I survived. His breath was right against my neck. At 15, I too thought I could take on the world. I thought, this is it. This is actually the end. I'm not going to hurt you. I survived. I'm going to tell you about that. I am an honest guy who made an honest mistake. I was there. I survived. His breath was right against my neck. At 15, I too thought I could take on the world. I thought, this is it. This is actually the end. I'm not going to hurt you. I survived. I'm going to tell you about that. Are you well? Are you good? I am. Right, well, we are nearly ending the Survivor series, but a few more crazy stories to go. Before I get to it, a few people have asked me where the shout outs have gone. Well, I normally do the shout-outs at the start of every episode, but for the Survivor Series, I've put them on hold, but I promise they will be back. Don't stop asking for them. I will get to them. I've just put them on hold for the Survivor Series. So, in the last episode, we talked wrongful convictions. And in this episode, we're going to talk space. Not space as in, like, outer space. Space as in small spaces. It sounds odd, I know, but bear with me. I also, I've had a couple of people ask me if I could do a warning. And sometimes I do with a story. Sometimes I do give a warning. But some people asked, could I do a warning? If the story was going to be particularly brutal. Well, this is your warning. This is not a pretty story at all. There is a lot of uh, quite horrific stuff that happens. But, 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 remember, this is the Survivor series. So, enough, uh, enough chit chat, Baza. Let's go on with it. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay. Let's go.
All right, it's January. It's 2004, and it's Wisconsin, USA. I'm pretty sure <laughs> American listeners are laughing at how badly I said Wisconsin. I just, it's a really hard one to say with a Scottish tongue. It just doesn't sound right. It sounds better in a, Wisconsin. If you say it in an American accent, it's it's way better. But it, yeah, just sounds it just sounds terrible when you say it as a Scottish person. Let's describe the weather in Wisconsin because it plays a really important part in the story. It was freezing. It was in two thousand and four. In December, freeze your bollocks off cold. That's how cold it was. <laughs> now, in the spirit of fairness and uh, not trying to make that a male-dominated statement, it was freeze your boobs off. <laughs> I would have said the T.I. TS words, but I just hate it. Ugh, I hate the word. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. So yeah, it was cold. <laughs> it was really cold. The kind of cold where you can like see your breath in front of you. Now, living in Wisconsin was a man named David Larson and his ex-wife Terry Jindusa. Now, they lived separately since their divorce. It hadn't been a particularly pretty divorce. It was a nasty end to a short and horrible, horrible marriage. David worked as an air traffic controller and Terry was at home with their kids. Two very, very young daughters. One was a baby and the other two years old. So together, David and Terry and their two daughters lived in a house, but it was not in any way a happy home. In a nutshell, to just get to the point... David Larson was a horrible, horrible dickhead of a man who made life unbearable for his wife. Absolutely unbearable. Terry lived in constant fear of her husband. So, some of his behaviours, they'll be familiar to those who hear true crime stories, bits of bits of his behaviour, they kind of remind me of the Francine story I told. I don't know if you remember the burning bed story. So the sort of echoes of that. David would insist on knowing where his wife Terry was at every minute of every day. So when he was at work, he would call her and constantly check up on her and see what she was doing. Well, what she was doing was she was at home raising their two young daughters. A two-year-old and a baby. That's what she was doing. But David thought, hmm, she might be doing something else. I need to keep checking up on her. When he was at home... He was so intimidating towards her. This is just horrible. When she went to the bathroom, he would make her leave the door open. When she went for a shower, she had to open the door so that he could see her at all times. I mean, that is a nightmare. That's a nightmare to live in. Who... Who wants or needs or 
ever wants to be in a situation where your partner opens the door when you're in the bathroom. Come on. That's just outrageous. And that's taking someone's privacy levels away from them to a ridiculous fucking level. That's just so intimidating. Things that would upset David are towels not being folded correctly in the house. He would lose his shit. He would go nuts if Terry hadn't folded all the towels in the correct way. If the curtains in their living room or their bedroom weren't sitting correctly, David would go insane and Terry would be subject to such abuse verbally and physically from him because the curtains weren't sitting correctly. Oh, it makes me think of that um, Julia Roberts film. Not uh, not Pretty Woman. <laughs> not Pretty Woman. Uh, sleeping, sleeping with your enemy? No, no, no. Sleeping with my enemy. Oh no, that's not right. I, you're oh sleeping with the sleeping with the enemy, sleeping with somebody's enemy. <laughs> the enemy, isn't it? Sleeping with the it's sleeping with the enemy. Do you know that bit at the end when she like opens the cupboard and he's like put all the tins facing in the same way? Scary. Kind of makes me think I want to watch that film again. Actually. That might be quite good. I mean, I know it's Christmas time and I should probably be watching The Grinch or Elf or something, but I'm like, no, no. I'll watch, I'll watch that film about domestic abuse. That's what I'll do. I'll watch that. <laughs> right, come on. Come on, Barry. Stay on track. So, back to Terry and David. When they first met, and how much do we know this story? He was lovely. He was charming. He was ideal for Terry at the time. She just thought, I've met the man of my dreams. I love him. He wants a family. I want a family. Let's get married. But David had different ideas. He wanted a wife, yes, but he only wanted a wife so that he could control a wife. Terry was basically in a situation where she couldn't get anything right. She couldn't do anything correctly. This is insane. But if she threw food away, he would lose the plot and accuse her of wasting money. I mean, it's madness. It's food that was off. It was food that needed to be in the bin. Terry got to a point where she would have to go and dispose of her garbage, her food that was out of date, in a neighbour's bin. Because when David came home every night, he would go through their family bin to see if she had thrown anything out that could have been used. And if there was a single thing, I mean, like, if there was a single bit of food in a bin that he was like, we could have eaten that, he would smack Terry across the face. He would punch her in the face and accuse her of wasting his money. I mean, fucking hell. If there was anything, anything at all, out of place in the house... Terry would be attacked by David. A cushion not sitting correctly. If one of the kids had left a toy lying out, that all added up to Terry being smacked in the face. It just gets more insane. He put locks on all the doors in the house that only he had keys for. So he was able to lock Terry and the kids into any room in the house 
and only he had the key to let them back out. During a really particularly bad argument one evening while Teddy was making dinner, the argument escalated and she knew that David was getting to the point where he was about to hit her and she runs from him. She runs away in fear. She runs down the hall and she hides in the basement. She gets into the basement and he locks her in the basement. Now, I said earlier on that this story was about spaces. The basement is not the space that I'm referring to and oh God, I wish it was. Oh fucking God, I wish it was. Terry's story is only going to get worse. So much worse than being locked in a basement. I'll interject what Terry thought in that moment. She thought this. I'm 30 years old and I'm cowering in my basement, hiding from my husband. What the hell am I doing? So it's not long after this that Terry decides that she's going to leave. She thinks, right, I've got two young daughters and it won't be long, it will not be long before this violence and this abuse starts on them. And she thinks, I'm out of here. However terrifying he is, I have to get out of this situation. And it's not, I mean, fuck, for her, that is not an easy decision to make. It's not an easy decision, right, for anyone to make. Of course it's not. But when your husband's David Larson, I'm pretty much imagining that's the scariest prospect because you think, I have to get myself and my two young daughters away from this man. And that's going to be hell. I mean, let's be honest, if this man cannot cope with towels not being folded correctly, then I can't imagine he's going to cope particularly well when his wife turns around and says, I'm leaving and I'm taking the girls. And of course, he doesn't take that well. He doesn't take it well at all. When Terry tells him that she's leaving, he attacks her and he accuses her of having an affair. She's not, of course she's not having an affair, but he thinks that's why she's leaving. Eh, uh, mate, do you want to actually just, like, take a wee second to yourself, look in the mirror and fucking realise she's leaving because you're a psycho. You, you are a psycho. I'm sorry to say it, but you are. You're, a, you're an absolute psycho. She's not leaving because she's shagging somebody else. <laughs> she's leaving because... You're a beast. You're a fucking beast of a man. That's why she's leaving. Not because of a fucking affair. What an idiot. So with the help and the support of her family and her friends, as horrific as it is to do, for Terry, she leaves David and she takes the girls. And she sets herself up still in Wisconsin. <laughs> but away from her husband, away from David. Thank God. Thank God she's away. So Terry starts legal proceedings to divorce him. It's not pretty for Terry. He tries to stop all the legal proceedings, but she demands a divorce. And eventually they get to the day where they sit in court and their divorce is about to happen. And as they sign the divorce papers, sitting in a courtroom with lots of other people, David looks at Terry and he says, You are going to 
regret this. And boy, oh boy, he wasn't wrong. He was really going to make Teddy regret leaving him. Okay, so what happened when she did leave David? Well, she met another man called Nick Nikolai. <laughs> I love, right, I love a first name, surname. I'm sure, right, and it... Maybe I'm wrong, but I think in a previous story there was a Peter Peterson <laughs> or a, a Jack Jackson <laughs> or somebody. I'm pretty sure there was a thread on the Facebook group about people who have similar first names and last names. <laughs> I just love it because it makes me laugh. <laughs> anyway, Nick Nikolai is the man that she meets and luckily for Terry, Nick Nikolai, he couldn't have been any more different from David. He was loving. He was so sweet. He just adored her and her two young kids. So with Nick Nikolai on the scene, how much do I just love saying his name? They are, you know, this is a this is a, now a really nice family. This is this is lovely. However, does it mean? that her ex-husband, David, is out of her life. Uh, sadly, no. It does not mean this. He has demanded, demanded through the courts, access to his daughters. Now, in court, Terry, she tries really hard to fight this. She says to the court, right, look, here's the thing. He was abusive. He was violent. And he was controlling with me. What it, it, what in his behaviour is going to change towards his daughters? Well, that's not really how the court sees it. And, like, honestly, this is a don't even get me fucking started on this. They see... A man sitting in court pleading for more time with his daughters. And so, that's what they award him. Because they're like, here's a father who's saying he, yes, him and his wife have split up and they're divorced. But here's a dad who really wants time with his kids. He's also a dad who has been physically and verbally abusing the mother in this situation for years, for years. But the courts, they just see, oh, here's a man, he wants to spend time with his kids. So how does it all play out? Well, David gets his wish. He gets to see his daughters regularly. And again, right, this is what does my head in. This is where the courts really, that whole system, it just fails Terry at this point. It is Terry who has to do all of the arranging with her ex-husband about when can they see the kids, where do they do the dropping off, how does all of that work. I mean, right, I know, um, okay, Maybe I'm being very idealistic here. Maybe I'm being very idealistic. And if I am, please tell me. But in the case, right, of a woman who has left her husband because of severe, bad, terrible domestic abuse, why should she have to be the one who organises all of the drop... Why should all of the drop-offs, all of the... Arranging who's got the kids when, what weekend, or you taking them on Monday. Oh no, I thought I was taking them, blah, blah, blah. Why should she have to go through that? Now, I understand. Yes, I do. I get. People will say, well then, what what are you going to do? Are you going to employ someone who's a go-between between between every ex-partnership in the world? No, you're not. Because 
that that's ridiculous. But I just feel like in Terry's case, why could no one see that she basically escaped a man who was so horrific to her, but she now still has to be in contact with him on a weekly basis? And I know, right, I know that sadly some of you listening will have the reality of having an ex and having kids and having to work that out between you and the whole alimony, yet another word that's quite hard to (laughs) say in a Scottish tongue. (laughs) It just sounds awful. But the whole alimony situation. Why should that be down to the person who has had to leave because of abuse? Why? I don't understand it. So the reality is for Terry that she has to go to the house that she once lived in and drop the kids off once a week. Each time that she arrives, David is verbally abusive. He calls her a slut, a whore, and a bitch. Each time that she goes to the house, he punches her in the face. And this is every time that she has to drop the kids off. Can you imagine the anxiety that she must have been feeling knowing when the time was coming around that she would have to see him. So brutal. So brutal. Nick, her new husband, Nick can't do anything. As much as he wants to, he he really wants to fight against this, but David Larson is such a brute of a man. And the thing that Terry and Nick always, always have to bear in mind is that David Larson has a large collection of guns in the house. And given given that he is a man on the edge, there is always for them that constant fear, that constant thing in the back of their head, just nervous that he's got guns in the house. What's also a really... And it shouldn't be, it's so sad. But what's also a really big fear for them is that Terry's discovered that she is pregnant. Just two months, the very, very early, early stages of pregnancy. And of course, Terry and Nick are over the moon. They're delighted because they're thinking, okay, we can welcome a new baby into the situation And with the two kids from the previous marriage, we can build this family. It's all going to be great, but they are so terrified that David might find out that Terry is pregnant because he's just such a bastard of a man that they just worry that he might ever know that she's pregnant. They think it's just going to escalate his anger even further. And it probably would. Things start to get progressively worse for Terry every time that she has to meet him to exchange the kids. I hate to say exchange the kids. It sounds like such a terrible way to put it. But essentially for Terry, that's really what it was. It was just an exchange. Because... Every time she goes to the house, he's verbally abusive and physically abusive. She says to him, from now on, I only want to meet you in a public place. And he actually agrees. He goes along with it. He says, okay, that's fine. So they don't drop off the kids at the house. Instead, they start doing it at places like McDonald's or shopping centres or restaurants. Because Terry is just not comfortable stepping in to the house with David at all. She doesn't know what he might do next. And the other reason 
is because the house that they had lived in, which David has lived in now on his own, is an absolute hellhole. Terry will say it looked like a hoarder's house. That's what it looked like. He'd be begun to become obsessed by not throwing anything away. So he was keeping hold of everything. Now, do you remember I told you earlier on about the bin situation where she had to hide things that she was throwing out of the house in another bin? It's because he's become obsessed by keeping hold of everything. Now, she's having to drop her kids off into that situation. But you know what? It's all right. It's okay, everyone. Don't panic. Because the courts have said, it's fine. It's totally fine. The courts are like, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. But the reality, the fucking reality for her is that she's actually having to literally hand her kids over to oh, her ex-husband who's living in a house that's just squalor. It's just mess everywhere because he can't throw anything away. David it, it is now living in a constant manic state. He's angry all the time. He's horrific to everybody and anybody that he meets. And Terry is really worried. Dropping the two kids off all the time is really stressful for her because their father is off the scale. Manic behaviour. What also bothers Terry, and I, I, and I do get this, is David had found a new girlfriend. Now, I'm not, I'm not in any way, because I don't judge. I'm not trying to throw shade on the new girlfriend. Uh, but there is a little bit of it that goes, look at the situation you have stepped into. You are going out with a very, very, very manic man. A man on the edge. This house is covered in filth. And he has two young kids. Is this really what you wanted for your life? Is this really the uh, mm, relationship you wanted? I mean, I don't think that anybody is looking at that situation and going, hmm... What a catch. <laughs> that's my that's my dream guy. I don't think anybody would be thinking that, but anyway, he does he has a new girlfriend. What really bothers Terry actually a lot about it is um when she drops the kids off, it tends to be the new girlfriend who looks after the kids. David just leaves leaves home. Just goes and does his own thing, comes back. Just, he's not spending any time with his daughters. So he's gone through this whole entire court case where he's like, I need time with my daughters. I need to know. Well, yeah, then spend time with them. Then actually spend time with them. Don't just then leave them to your new girlfriend. You fucking spend time with him. <sighs> yeah. So, as I said, Terry drops the kids off in public places, but that is until January 28th, 2004, when this story is going to take a very dark turn. David has had his two daughters for the weekend and when the time comes for them to be returned Terry thinks that the agreement is to meet in a McDonald's to hand the kids back. Terry gets a phone call from David 
and he says, actually, could you come to the house and collect the girls? And Terry says, um, I can, but I thought we agreed McDonald's. And he says, yeah, 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 yeah. I know we did, but there's just been a change of plan. Sorry. I'm home with the girls. Could you just come to the house and get them? Now, outside it is snowing heavily. The weather has turned really bad. And Terry, she doesn't really want to have to drive through the snow to collect her daughters. But she will. Of course, she will. Terry, at this point, has a really bad feeling. And she tries to ignore the voice in her head, telling her that something isn't right. So she goes to the house with this bad feeling. And when she gets there, she just wants to get the kids and get out of there. Never ignore the voice. When she arrives, David is a very, very calm. In a way that he never is calm. He's calm. And he's civil, and he's nice to Terry. And all that does is that unnerves her even further. When she steps into the house, she asks, where are the kids? And David says, oh, well, they're playing a game of hide and seek. And they thought it would be fun for you to try and find them. Now the anxiety levels in Terry are creeping up to panic level. But she thinks, well, if the girls want to play a game before we go home, then that's fine. I don't want to disappoint my kids. David is still very calm. Very chilled out. And so Terry begins to go around the house and look for her daughters in their game of hide and seek. It's as she's walking through the house thinking she's looking for her daughters that David stands behind her with a baseball bat and he raises the bat above Terry's head And he starts to beat her with the bat. The first knock hits her to the floor. David continues to beat her repeatedly with the baseball bat until she's barely conscious. He beats her face so badly that her nose is broken and that she can't see out of her eyes because there is so much blood running down her head. He raises the bat over her head and he smashes her skull. He then moves on to her body and he attacks her body with the bat. He hits her in the stomach He hits her in the legs, he hits her ankles, and now Terry lies in a pool of blood on the floor as David stands above her, screaming at her that she's ruined his life. Terry has been so badly beaten that she cannot physically pull herself up from the floor. David believes that he has beaten her so viciously that she will stop breathing soon. Three hours later, Nick is at home and he is starting to get worried. So with his schedule, he's like, 
Terry left to pick up the girls three hours ago and I haven't heard from her. He's tried calling and calling but he's heard nothing. He's thinking, why isn't she home? Where is she? What's happening? And because he knows what her ex-husband David is like, he calls the police. He tries to report Terry missing. He explains the situation and he says, look, my wife went to her ex-husband's to collect the kids. There's been a lot of trouble between them before. He's very violent. He's this kind of guy. Can we do a check on this, please? Because I can't get hold of her. Now, police are, at first, not terribly interested. But somewhere in the conversation, they sit up and they pay attention. When? Nick gives them the address of David Larson. Police are now confused because a call has come from near the property of David about an hour ago. A call has come from a cell phone and they've traced it to that property but police couldn't really make head nor tail of what that phone call was. So okay, let's let's break this down. So Nick calls the police. He says, look, my wife hasn't come home. She was at this address. Police go, okay. Hmm. Actually, we received a phone call on a mobile phone, on a cell phone, from that property about an hour ago, but we just couldn't understand what it was. Okay, so what was the call that police had received? Well, it was a woman's voice and it was muffled. It was really muffled and that's why police were struggling with it because it was just a muffled female voice shouting an address into the phone. They thought they could kind of decipher what the address was. And now that Nick has phoned, they realise, oh, that's the same address. This person shouting down the phone was trying to give us. Police, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to do a disservice to police here, but when the muffled phone call came, Police sort of thought it was a bit of a prank. Didn't really take it that seriously. They just, it kind of just went like, oh God, here's a silly call we received from somewhere. Put it aside. Doesn't really matter. Let's move on to serious things. But they did note the address and it was only when Nick called that they went, oh, hang on. We've had a couple of calls in a very short space of time about this address. So what the hell was going on? That's what police were asking. That's what Nick was asking. And I'll pretty much bet that's what you're asking. What the hell is going on? The last time we knew anything of Terry, she was lying in a pool of blood on the floor. And now it appears that there's been a call made to police shouting an address into the phone. So, what's happened? Police knew that David Larson was a violent man. Everyone in David's life knew that he was a man on the edge. But what nobody knew is just how sadistic this man could be. In other words, just a complete prick of a man. Just awful. After he had beaten Terry to a pulp, David dragged his ex-wife's body 
out of the house. Now, she is barely alive at this point. He drags her out and he puts her into a bin. A garbage bin. A fucking bin he puts her in. Now, it's not a big bin that he puts her in. What he does is he crams her body into this tiny, tiny small space. He rams her body into this little fucking bin. And worse than that, I mean, even worse. Do you remember? Do you remember what I said, what the weather was like? It was cold. It was so cold. The snow had fallen. So David opens the garbage bin that he has put her into and he shovels snow on top of Terry's body. He shovels in snow to surround her cramped up and half dead body. He packs the whole entire small bin with snow around her body. So that's where she's now lying and that's what she's covered with. What does David do next? Well, he gets duct tape and he makes sure that the lid of the bin is tightly secured and that Terry cannot escape. He lifts the bin and he puts it in the back of his truck and he drives off. Where the hell is he going? Well, I'll tell you. He's going to his storage unit. His plan, his great plan, is to leave Terry inside the bin, covered in snow, until she dies. So he puts the bin in the storage unit, he locks it up tight, and he leaves. He leaves it behind, believing that he has left his ex-wife to die. Okay, I know it's rough. I know it's rough. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. So the mystery call, the mystery call, the muffled voice from the woman giving the address. What the hell was that? Well, even in the state that Terry was in, when she's inside that small, tiny space, she remembers that her phone is in her pocket. Survival mode. Survival mode just kicks fucking in. Survival mode for her. She manages to, and I love this. I love it so much. I just, yeah, I think this woman's incredible. I do. I love her. She manages to get her hand, I mean, fucking hell, in this small space, covered in snow, and beaten, fucking nearly to death, she gets her hand inside her pocket, now what she can't do is, she can't quite get her phone out, because the space is so small, and her body's so twisted up in it, but she manages to start just pressing buttons on her phone, just, again, just to make that really clear, her phone's in her pocket and she's just reaching her hand down and she's just pressing all the buttons that she can and what she does is she knows she's unlocked the phone and she concentrates so so hard on just being able to guess on her phone where the right numbers 911 are and when the call picks up from inside that bin All she can do is she can shout the address to police of where she is. And that's the muffled call that police heard that they thought was either a prank or they thought was not really to be taken seriously. 
They traced the call to the address, but they didn't really think it was anything that they should really be worried about. It was just some nonsense call or whatever. But actually, it was her from inside that fucking horrific experience trying to call police. So now police are a bit more across the situation. They're starting to put together the muffled phone call, the fact that she's been reported missing, and so they go to David Larson's house. And when they get there, this is what they find. The bloody baseball bat. A pair of Terry's shoes. And, horrifically, the two young kids helplessly locked in a room by their dad in a room that only he can access they have been locked in a room and left for hours it escalates quickly and 100 police officers begin the search for Terry they know by now they're not, they're not just looking for a mother who's casually vanished. This is something serious. Word spreads really fast around the community, and this is why I love communities. Hundreds of people come out to start to search for Terry. I'm talking like woods, rivers, back streets, people are searching everywhere for her. But nobody knows, nobody except David Larson knows that she is in that storage unit and she's inside that bin in freezing conditions. David Larson gets quickly apprehended by police who say, okay, look, just level with us. Where is she? Where is she now? Right, there's no point fucking about with us anymore, David. Just tell us where she is. He denies all knowledge. He doesn't... He says, I don't know a thing. I I haven't seen her. Bull fucking shit, you fucking big prick. You... I would kick you in the cock right now if I fucking could. He says, no, don't know. Don't know where she is. So police say, well, okay, look, you can say, David, you don't know where she is, but can we talk about the fact that there is a bloody baseball bat in your house? Her shoes are in your house, and two of your daughters are locked up in your house. Explain yourself. He doesn't. He just keeps quiet. Says nothing. But police have, in the meantime worked out that he owns a storage unit and a search of the unit is done. When police enter that unit, it's dark and two police officers walk in. They turn the lights on and they're expecting when they walk in to see Terry, but they don't. They start to look around and think, Oh, we thought we were going to find her here. And it's as they're going to leave that they hear a whimpering sound. A soft sound coming from somewhere, but they can't see where it's coming from. They follow the whimpering sound. They can hear it, they get closer to it. And they see a garbage bin in the corner which has been covered with blankets. It's been covered with a tarpaulin. It's it's been hidden away. And they can still hear the sound. The two officers, they rip off the lid. And what they see inside is terrifying. Terry is inside the bin and her body is now blue from the cold. Her eyes are closed shut with dried blood. She is beaten so badly that it takes them a minute to 
try and understand what they're looking at. But she is making a sound. She is breathing. They lift her out immediately and they call for help. The two police officers, they wrap Terry in whatever they can find in that moment to just try and get some warmth into her body. One of the officers, Officer Samson, he holds her body until the ambulance arrives and he can put her in the back. He will um, later say that that evening he went home to his wife, he hugged her and he cried his heart out because in years of policing he had never seen a body in such a state. When Terry gets to the hospital, the doctor who will eventually become well known for his treatment of Terry says this, she didn't even look like a human being. I had no idea what I was looking at. Between the frostbite and the beatings, Terry's face and body was so broken. So Terry is in the hospital and David has now been arrested and is being kept by police. So at this moment, if you're having trouble with this story, please know what I'm going to describe in the next part is just horrible and I won't judge you if you need to turn it off. Terry's skull had been smashed open with the baseball bat. The bones in her face were broken. She is bleeding internally and the freezing conditions have given her such severe frostbite that she's now lost all of her toes and she's starting to lose her fingers. Her heart rate is so low and because of the bleeding, doctors predict Terry has an hour to live. An hour. An actual hour. Oh my god. It's just, it's like a death sentence. It's just horrific. Of course, Terry's family are called to the hospital and have Of course, they're warned, they're told, what you are about to see is going to be traumatic. It's going to be so traumatic. And it is, of course. Nick arrives to see the love of his life close to death. The family are told, say your goodbyes to Terry because she won't make it through the night. The hour to live for Terry passes and she's still breathing. She's still alive. And it's at this point that the doctor I was talking about earlier on called Dr. Jimenez. He's the one who, I said, when she arrived said she didn't even look human. God bless this man. He says in this moment, Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cancel everything else that I'm doing right now because I am going to save this woman. Now that's pretty bold of him because he's surrounded by a group of doctors and nurses who are going, it's too late, she's she's going to die this this is what it is and he goes no I think I can save her so there's first of all there's a plan to amputate her feet to see if they can stop the infection that started 
in her body to spread upwards. And he says, wait, 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 wait. He says, let's not go amputating things without checking out all of the possibilities. So her feet are not amputated. Yes, she's lost her toes, but he says, no, let's not, let, let's not do that. Just wait. He puts together a plan and it's a scary, scary plan, but he puts it together quickly and he says, I'm proposing these 10 different operations and they will save her life. If we can do them correctly, if we can do them in the right order, I can, I can get this woman to live. Now there's objection, massive objection from the hospital staff who say, Look, that's too many operations. I don't think her body can take it. And he says, yeah, it can. And it's really interesting, right, watching him speak. So I've watched a few interviews with him now. It's just brilliant because he goes, he just, he's, I don't know, he's just, he's amazing in the way that he goes. I knew that she was strong and even though her body was close to death and I knew that I was taking a massive risk with 10 operations, I just somehow knew she could take it. I mean, that's the doctor, isn't it? <laughs> that is the doctor that you want on your side all the time. <laughs> that's the doctor you want <laughs> in the room whenever anything goes wrong. I hope this doctor exists for all of us. So Terry stays in hospital. And so the operations begin one by one. Every one of them is touch and go. Will she make it through this next one? Who knows? She undergoes a blood transfusion and there are complications. Her family are told she's got two days to live, but she comes through it. She receives surgery on her face and a blood clot begins to appear. Her family are told she has a week to live. The week passes, she comes through it. Dr Jimenez will just not give up on Terry. He just will not give up and day by fucking day she starts to get better all the time it takes six months in hospital and it takes 10 operations but the day finally arrives when terry can leave the hospital she leaves in a wheelchair pushed by her husband nick old nick nikolai <laughs> And she heads home to her two daughters to start her recovery. It takes nearly two years, but Terry does make a recovery, a full recovery. David Larson is charged with the attack and attempted murder of his ex-wife and he is sentenced to 35 years in prison. I don't really think 35 years is enough, but okay. That's what, if that's what the courts think. I mean, because the courts got it so right the first time round. Do you know what I mean? There's no way they could fucking get it wrong again. <sighs> so with him behind bars, Terry can actually start to remake her life. She can start to think about raising her kids again, invest in her marriage. You know, she can start to get a sense of life again. And Terry does... What I love when survivors survive. She starts to talk. She tells her story. She speaks out. She talks about the fact that she was let down by the criminal justice system. And that essentially what they did was they threw fucking Terry at David's mercy. Like she had no option but to have to have contact with her ex-husband. And although, you know, she wants to put her life 
back together, put this all behind her and forget about it. She chooses, and I think it's such a brave choice, she chooses, no, I'm just going to actually talk about this. I'm going to raise awareness to help people who are not protected to be protected. And, you know, I really am happy to say that Terry and Nick and the two kids from her previous marriage are living really happily and Terry continues, continues to this day to campaign for the protection of vulnerable spouses. Terry was on Oprah, for God's sake. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Still not quite got around to that uh, time when me and Oprah are going to do a programme together, but we'll get there. But Terry would be one of my first guests. When asked what Terry thinks helped her to survive, she said this. Inside the freezing space, thinking I was going to die, I thought about my girls. I thought, what's he going to do to them? What kind of life are they going to have to live with this kind of monster as their father? And I couldn't let my girls experience that. And so ends the story. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that. It's brutal in parts. It's horrific. But, you know, we hopefully we all got through it together. Hopefully, yeah. I hope we're all okay. <laughs> yeah. Her, yeah, her story just, it really, yeah, just... It just stays with me. It just, yeah, really just, woo. Horrible. Okay. <laughs> if you want to get in touch, please do. Extraordinary Stories Podcast at gmail.com. If you want to email me, I'm on the Instagram, I'm on the Twitter, there's the Facebook group, just join it. It's amazing. Can't keep saying it, but it is amazing. If you want to support the podcast, you can through Patreon. That would be lovely. If you just want to, like, I don't know, like, say hi, just get in touch. Just please get in touch. It's really lovely to hear from everyone. I really like it. I really do. I really enjoy it. I, do you know what? I'm babbling now. I'm, you know, the thing is, like, uh, yeah, I just... <laughs> I can't... Li- Sometimes with the stories, I can't, once I've told it, I, can't, I don't know, there's like a weird moment in me where I go, I can't get that out of my brain. Like I can't, I, obviously I've lived with the story for like a time because I've researched the story and I've understood the story and I've then found a way to tell the story. But sometimes that's easier to disconnect from a story. And, oh my God, I'm just babbling on all the box now. No, I'll just tell you what I'm thinking. Sometimes it's, it's dead easy for me. No, no, it's not dead easy. Oh, I'm just, why am I talking in circles? Sometimes it's easier to slightly disconnect from a story. And there's certain ones where I find it really difficult to disconnect from the story. And this one, I don't know why it is, but I just find this one quite hard. So I'm trying to do the whole, like, <laughs> my whole sign off, follow me on Twitter, all this pish, but actually, no, it's not pish. All that, <laughs> just call it pish, it's no pish, all that stuff, but I just can't, I can't quite get the image of her in a bin covered by snow out of my brain. So anyway, yeah, that was a really great, um... Uh, foray into my thoughts which are just probably bollocks and if you are still listening 
you probably deserve a gold star for actually still listening because I've just wittered the biggest load of shit in the last couple of minutes. So, all I want to say is, <laughs> thanks for listening. Okay, goodbye. Oh, buddy. Why are you such a dick? Why are you such a dickhead? It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. Alimony. Ala... Al... Al... Alum... Alum... Alimony. Ella... Alimony. Oh, God. Sounds like I'm saying bloody... Balamori. Which, for those of you who don't know what Balamori is, it's a fictional um, Scottish TV show. Well, kids' TV show set in a in a, in a little town, and it's got a theme tune that goes Balamori, Balamori. What's the story in Balamori? Wouldn't you like to know? Great, great show. <laughs> Do you know sometimes, right? I'm just going to be really honest with you here. We'll get back to the story in a second. I'm just going to say this: sometimes, I just, I literally just talk and it's only when I go back to edit that I go Barry what the fuck is wrong with your brain I mean I've just literally heard myself go from the injustice of the court system to singing the Balamori theme tune I don't even really know how that happens (laughs) <laughs> I think I'd need to speak to a professional. <laughs> if there's a professional out there who can help me, please get in touch. I think I genuinely need to see if my brain is wired correctly because I, I don't really think it is. I would imagine from the look on his face. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. <laughs>